Howdy and welcome to the 10-Week Bible Study Podcast. This is week two, day four of our study of the book of Acts. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Acts 5, 1 through 16. Welcome back to the 10-Week Bible Study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Would you join me as we pray before we start today? Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us, God? Fill us with the knowledge of you. We want to be fascinated by you and your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Acts 5, starting at verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. We're going to see it's not initially super clear, but we're going to see by the end of this passage that what's going on here is Ananias and Sapphira, they see what Barnabas have done, they see what other people have done, and Luke is specifically ending that last section with Barnabas. They see that there's favor on him, they see, they're they they're linking that to his giving, even though that's not actually true, that's not why the apostles favored him. Um, but they're, they're putting the two and two together in that way, and so they are basically saying, hey, we want to have a higher station in life within this group. We want to be seen as as people like Barnabas. We want the apostles to like us. We want notoriety here. We want that political power that comes with those kinds of donations. And so they're like, you know, so we're going to sell this thing and we're going to go bring them some of the money, but we're going to tell them it's all of the money. Right? It doesn't initially make that clear that's what's going on. By the end of this this whole passage, we're going to see that they have decided they're going to sell their property. They're going to bring part of the proceeds, but but tell them this is this is you know the proceeds from what we sold. This is all of it. This is all the money. Um, this is a big deal. <laughs> this is a, a a really big deal here because again, this is like I said yesterday. This is exactly what the the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this is what they were guilty of. They were using this religious position to enrich themselves. They would make themselves look high and mighty. They would look them, make themselves look pious. And one of the things that benefits you from doing that is, <clears throat> is if you get in this position where, you know, piety, or at least looking like you're pious is the currency that you trade in for power, which is exactly what the Jews did. And if you're more pious, you get to be in charge. And if you're in charge, you get to make the rules. And if you get to make the rules, you can make them really favor yourself. And you can get really rich off of this. We see this right now. There's just no end to stories and things about our our Congress people, our presidents, past presidents, how greatly they enrich themselves using their positions, right? And, and everybody sees it. Nothing's done about it anymore, but everybody sees it. People will go into relatively speaking, these low paying, um, and it's all relative here, but low paying congressional jobs. Now they may, might be making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but when you consider after they've been there for 10 years and all of a sudden now they have a net worth of $20 million, um, that's what I mean, relatively speaking, they're low paying jobs because you don't make $20 million off of 200,000 unless you've got insider information, unless you got people passing you money, unless you're doing stuff on the side that people without connections can't do. The return on investment for being a, a, a Washington level politician in our country right now, there's nothing else with that kind of return on investment. Because you get to raise money, other people's money to get yourself elected. And then you make the rules, you make the rules to favor yourself and you get very, very rich in the process. Now, not all of them. I'm not saying everyone does this, but we just have so many examples and it's from both parties here in the United States. That's what you get if you're in charge. Is you get to make the rules and when you make the rules, you get to keep the gold. <laughs> so the saying goes, right? And uh, this is not going to make Peter happy. Peter's already stood up to everyone else 
I don't know what they were thinking. They got, they got really caught up by the enemy here. Verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to just a human beings, but to God. Peter's saying, listen, you didn't have to sell this. Nobody's making you sell this thing. It was yours. It was your thing, your property that you own. And even after you sold it, you could have come to us and said, hey, we sold this property. Here's half the money from it. You could have done that. You could have done anything other than lying to us about this to try and make yourself look like something in front of everyone. It's like, this is bad. You're not lying to me. You're lying to God. And here's the amazing thing. Peter prophetically knows this, right? No one's telling them this. That it's just the husband and wife who's conspired. And we find out that this conspiracy is very well contained. The husband, Ananias, and Sapphira, neither one of them ratted each other out. They're, they're in this together. So Peter knows prophetically. The Lord is speaking to him. Again, we've moved so far beyond the casting of lots. They show up and Peter immediately somehow knows what's going on. And I don't know how he knew, but the Lord spoke to him. And he knows exactly what's going on. Now, I'm not 100% sure that, that Peter knew this next part was going to happen the way it did. Maybe he did. Maybe the Lord spoke to him like in a dream the night before saying, hey, Ananias and Sapphira are going to bring you something, but they're really lying to me and I'm going to kill them for it. Maybe they, the Lord just told them what they were doing, but not what he was going to do with them. One way or another, um, this is not going to go well for them. Verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. And some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And obviously, Peter here is quoting the lying price that Ananias had quoted him. And so he's just testing her on this. And she says, yeah, that's, that's what we got for it. So he knows that they're both in on it together. Verse 9, Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the Holy Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they, were, they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her in, beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Let me make it clear. This is not a reverential fear that some people describe. This isn't like, oh, God is great and God is good and I have a, a holy fear of him, meaning I I think he's really neat and I honor him and I honor him with my words. That's, that's the understanding of fear of God that most people have. And nowhere in scripture, nowhere in scripture do we get that connotation. <laughs> nowhere. Everywhere in scripture, when it talks about the fear of the Lord, it's like we realize, we come to the realization that he is the one who decides when our last breath will be. He's the one who decides where we spend eternity. And that is a terrifying thing because we have no control over those things. We have no control over those things, but he does. So the fear of the Lord is, oh my gosh, it falls on them. And, and they're all thinking, have I done anything where I've even slightly lied to the apostles, slightly lied to anybody else here? Am I lying to God, right? That's the fear of the Lord that comes over them is what kind of sin is in my life? This is a, a, a holiness that the Lord imposes on people. Most people think of, of holiness as... This, this false piety where we've got to pretend and we've got to act like, you know, we're doing all the right things. And that's, that's what they equate to that. And, they, and there's, there's pressures on people to kind of act a certain way within the, a church environment. And it turns people off. You know, people can smell that kind of 
nonsense from a mile away. And so the idea of holiness and that word holiness, it's, it's, it's marred in some ways. But holiness under the Lord, when he is the one bringing about this kind of fear where we realize, oh my gosh, like God is serious about sin. God is serious about us living righteously before him. And it doesn't mean that we do enough good things to earn salvation. It's not what I'm talking about. So this many times in the podcast is that legalism is when we determine that we're going to self-justify ourselves. We're going to, we're going to do enough good things so that, you know, we're at least better than those other guys. And if we're better than those other guys, then God's happy with us, but he's not happy with them. That's self-justification, self-justification. And, and that is, that is legalism. That's the opposite of, of the, the grace and the favor of the Lord through the blood of Jesus. But if we understand what the blood of Jesus has done for us, the fact that our sins are forgiven for all eternity, for all eternity, because of the blood of Jesus, we will live with God in perfection forever, even though we don't deserve it. When we understand that, nothing else makes sense with the rest of our lives except to offer and give up the rest of our lives willingly to God and to live in holiness for him. So holiness is not this, this standard exacted by religious elites on those that go to church. Holiness is what God requires of us because there's nothing else that makes sense after we understand what his blood has done for us. That's the kind of fear that's, that's seizing the entire church and everybody who hears about this. They're thinking, oh my gosh, I want to I live holy. I don't want to get crosswise with the Lord because he doesn't mess around. The thing about this, and and I've heard many people, I've read many commentaries on this, is that the Lord was, was being very harsh at the outset of the church. And I think there's some truth to that. I think there's some truth to that. Is we have just left behind all these Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus has spoken against them. And within months, we've got people trying to act like that again. And the Lord's not having it. Jesus is not having it with his brand new bride. Not going to put up with this with this fledgling infant church, right? I don't know necessarily that the Lord deals this harshly with people. I mean, in fact, one of the most common questions that people ask of God and Christianity is, why would a good God let bad things happen to good people? And there's several things wrong with that question, right? The, the first thing is that we're making the assumption that people are good. <laughs> Jesus himself is like, yeah, you're not good. You're not good. You know how to get good, good, good. You know how to give good gifts, but you're not good. You're sinful. You have a sinful human nature and your propensity is to do bad. And so that part of the question is wrong. But then on top of that is why would God allow that to happen? And part of the answer is, well, if the Lord smote us, at the moment that we deserved it, not many of us would live past five. Some of them would. Some of us wouldn't have made it past three years old, right? If we, if the, if God came down to smite us, the moment that we do wrong, the moment that we sin, the moment that we cross the line, the moment that we use and abuse others, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. None of you would be listening to me. We wouldn't make it far. And so it's the Lord's patience that he allows people to walk in sin because we're so fallen and broken. If he, if he didn't, if he just, if he just went and he said, I'm going to smite thee right now because you've done this thing wrong. No one would be alive. It's his patience and his forgiveness and his forbearance that we're even here because even though bad things happen to what we would consider good people, how many of those good people have done bad things to other people? We've all done bad things to other people. None of us deserve the grace that we've been given. And so this is that moment where, where God tells Moses in the Old Testament, Listen, I'm going to have mercy on whom I'm having mercy on. Now, yeah, fortunately for us, he has mercy on almost everyone almost all the time. But this is one of those moments where he's like, I am not going to have mercy on Ananias and Sapphira. I'm going to nip this in the bud. This is not going to happen at this stage in the, in the, the life of the church. And it fills everyone with fear. Verse 12. 
The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their numbers. So, so what we've got is, is almost this paradox. No one wants to join them because they're afraid. Like, if I join, maybe I'll get caught in a lie and God will kill me, right? That's, that's all going on. Solomon says that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? Meaning that we enter into this relationship with God, the beginning of wisdom, right? That is coming before the Lord, laying ourselves bare before him. The fear of God is what leads us into that. Now, he doesn't say that the fear of God is wisdom itself. He says it's the beginning of wisdom. I love that he says that because we don't live there. We don't stay in in fear of God. We don't stay afraid of God. Once we get to know him and, and the, the grace and the mercy that he's given us, we can't stay afraid of a God like that. But when we initially come to terms with the fact that he's the one that makes all of the most important decisions in our life, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. But as we get to know him and we realize what he's done for us, the terror goes away real fast. We realize, holy cow, you're good. Oh my God goodness, God, you are so good. You're so forgiving and so patient, and so kind. So that's the, the, the paradox that's going on is, is people don't want to be associated with that. But at the same time, it's like, I, I have to join them. I have to know this God. I have to know him. And so they're joining anyway. They keep doing it. Verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Verse 15. As a result, People brought in the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some as he passed by. The, the implication here is that it happened, that Peter's shadow healed people. Holy cow, the Holy Spirit is being poured out in such a dramatic way. Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those who, torment, who were tormented by impure spirits and all of them were healed. Listen to that. They brought the sick and they brought the demon possessed and all of them were healed. This is Jesus level stuff here and it's the apostles doing it. This is Jesus level stuff. Maybe even above and beyond. And these men are doing it. They're no different than you and I. Jesus looked at Thomas when Thomas is like, I'm not going to believe unless I see the scars in your hands inside. And Jesus holds him out. He holds out his hand and says, here you go. Touch him. <laughs> and Thomas sees him and then all, he's gripped with fear of his own unbelief. And Jesus is like, well, touch me right here. Come on, touch it. Thomas is like, uh, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to touch it. And Jesus says to Thomas and all of the disciples, he's like, blessed are you because you believe, but you've seen, you've seen all the things you've been with me. But he essentially says the people who have not been here with us these last two and a half, three years have not seen all these things and they believe they're like double blessed. See what these guys did. It's available to us. This can change us, it can change us personally, it can change our church, it can change our city, it can change our nation, it can change our world if we'll throw ourselves into it, if you really will throw ourselves into it. For the 10-week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-week Bible study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God's Word. Thank you.